Hey everybody, my name's Aaron. Welcome back to the channel. Well, the Apple One that I built a while ago has been sitting around for far too long buck naked. It's time that I put a case on this thing. It's going to be difficult, but I'm always up for the challenge on the Retro Hack Shack. So I need to build a case for the Apple One, but that's not necessarily an easy thing to do because, well, there was no original case sold with the Apple One. But if we look at the cases that do exist, we can find some examples and maybe find one to emulate. So the case that I used as the cover of the history video I did showed this Apple One, which was on display in the Smithsonian for a number of years. And this case was actually built by Randy Wigington's brother. Now, Randy Wigington was Apple employee number six, I believe, and he uh, started at Apple as a teenager at the age of 14. Chris Espinosa actually confirmed this. Now, Chris was Apple employee number eight, and he too was there at Apple right from the beginning. And in fact, according to Wikipedia, is still an Apple employee today. Amazing. The contributions of Randy and Chris to Apple's early history uh, are probably worth an episode in and of themselves. There's so many of them. I can't go into them all in one video. There's another case that was built by Randy Wigington's father, uh, which actually housed the very first Apple One computer that was built by hand by Steve Wozniak. In fact, in a video that went with the Apple IIc release, Steve Wozniak talked about the history of the company while he was at the Apple Museum and had this to say about the Apple I and its case. Right over here, we've got the very first computer we ever built long before we even started a company. And back in those days, you had to scrounge all the components you could for as free or as cheap as you could. And there's probably under $200 total that ever went into buying a few parts at the local electronics store. I hand wired the entire bottom, soldered it all together personally because there was no way to afford a technician. And uh, that was an Apple One, the first Apple One computer ever. The case, we didn't deliver them in a case. It was sort of like every one you had to customize yourself. So a friend's father built the case. And way in the corner is an example of how you had to customize every individual Apple One because we did not supply a case with the computer. And that would be the first, we, we originally conceived of these as the Apple One and the Apple Two as the first portable computers of all time. And of course that the word has changed over time. There are a few other examples of cases that exist. For example, there was this prototype metal case that was pulled out of Steve Jobs' office after he left Apple in 1985. I actually toyed with the idea of making this case, but in the end, I thought I'd go with a different one. And then there was another case that was sold at the Byte Shop. It's made out of koa wood and was apparently manufactured by a local cabinet maker. This case is the one that I think I will try to reproduce. Number one, it's the most uh, functional looking case, and it looks kind of like the case that was used with the Apple II a year later when that hit the market. Now that I had decided on a case design, I ran into my first issue. I started designing the case in Fusion 360, but the problem was, what were the original dimensions of this Koa case, the Byte Shop case? Well, that turned out to be more difficult to solve than I anticipated. It turns out these measurements have really never been taken as far as I know, at least not in the public domain. And the only people that have these cases are collectors that are hard to get a hold of or museums. I did try to reach out to one museum and of course I heard absolutely nothing back. Which is kind of expected, after all most of the museums are closed due to the human malware. When faced with a problem like this, there are some workarounds. What I was able to do was take a look at some of the cases that exist and measure some of the components that I could find dimensions for and then use that as a guide to build out the rest of the case. I started on the back and looked at this IEC plug. I could easily find the dimensions for that plug and by stacking those up on top of each other, I could figure out how tall the back of the case was. For the sides, I knew what the overall length of the board was since I have one here in front of me, so that was pretty easy to estimate. And for the width, I knew the width of the keyboard. I also knew that I needed to put some power supply components inside the case next to the board, so I needed to leave some room on one side of the board for that. 
And then it was just a matter of figuring out what the slope might be for the keyboard. Once that was all done, I had the drawings in hand and was ready to start building the case. And here's what the design actually looks like. Now, luckily, a user who had made their own case years earlier was on Facebook, and he was actually able to measure his dimensions that he did the same process for, and they matched up exactly. So I felt pretty good that this was going to work. So now that I knew the dimensions, it was time to get started on building the actual case. To do a project like this, you do need to know something about woodworking. Luckily for me, I've done quite a bit of woodworking in the past. I've built bookcases, I've built uh, furniture and mirrors and things like that. So I feel pretty confident in my skills here. However, these original cases in some cases were not really built by professional woodworkers. So even if you don't have a lot of skills, you could still try it out. After all, it's just wood. So if you don't like what you build, you can scrap it and start over. I decided to go with plywood for the panels and hardwood for the sides. This would allow me to cut out some slots in the edges of the hardwood to accept the panels. Now I could start cutting out the individual pieces, starting with the largest one and gradually working my way down to the smallest one. After that, I used a router to cut out the grooves in the sides for the top and back and front panels so that they would all fit in nice and neat and be very sturdy. Cutting these slots out can be tricky because you have to do it blind. You can't see where the bit is when you're actually performing the cut. So you can make some marks with some tape and that'll tell you where to insert the wood at the beginning of the cut and where you should end so that you don't rip through the end of the piece. It's important to have some airflow through the case because the voltage regulators can get quite hot. I didn't want to have to insert a fan as that wouldn't be authentic, number one, and number two, it would actually create a lot of noise. So then the question was, what type of slot should I cut in the case to maximize the airflow and keep the case as cool as possible? Some of the original cases had cutouts in the back and in the bottom for airflow, but I wasn't sure if that was the best configuration. So I decided to test this out by building a mock case out of cardboard. This way I could move the air slots around as needed and actually measure what the impact was on the components. So the best result that I got was a opening in the back right near the 5 volt regulator, and then another opening in the very front of the case and not on the bottom, as was done in some of the original cases. Armed with that information, I was able to use a scroll saw to cut out the places where I needed the airflow to be, as well as to cut out some spaces for power and other components that needed to be installed on the back panel. Cutting out the keyboard turned out to be an interesting challenge as well. As you can see, to cut around each of the irregular shapes of the keys, you have to be really careful and very precise. So what I did was turn again to Fusion 360, where I created a 3D template of the hole that I would need to cut out for the keyboard. Then I printed it out on a 3D printer, carefully traced around, and cut out the opening with a jigsaw. I'll leave links to these documents in the description below. However, keep in mind that this will only work with a, this particular Apple II keyboard. Your keyboard may need a different cutout in order to fit precisely. And then it was time to do some sanding. It's much easier to do the sanding before you glue the pieces together because there's a lot of inside corners that are going to be really hard to reach once this is glued up. Now it's time to glue the case together, and this is the last chance to check everything. So make sure to do a dry fit uh, when you're doing this type of project. Have your glue ready, have some wet, warm, wet rags ready as well to wipe off any excess glue, because you only have about 15 minutes to work with this before it starts to set solid enough that you're not gonna be able to work with the wood anymore. After I got everything in place, I added a couple of clamps just to hold everything together securely, and then I let it set overnight. Uh, Penny? Penny? You're not getting into my projects, are you? No! Not the PCB way box. Come on now. Those are, give me my circuit boards. The next question was, how was I going to affix the bottom of the case to the case itself? 
In some of the pictures I was able to find, they secured the bottom of the case to a length of wood that was glued to the side of the case, but this seemed to take up a lot of room. What I decided to do was to cut some blocks of wood out of the scrap pieces I had laying around and then use this little kit, which included some brass inserts, to screw those into some holes. This kit came with a drill that was the right size and a driver, which admittedly did not work that great. Then to avoid guessing where these should go on the side of the case, I screwed these in to the bottom, glued the sides, and then put the case on and screwed it in. So this held everything in place while the glue dried, and I didn't have to measure and try to figure out where these blocks should go on the side of the case. And that worked pretty well, but I did have to add some glue to one of the blocks that didn't make good contact with the side of the case on the first try. Now it was time to stain the case, and really this is one of the most precarious parts of the whole project because I decided to use some water-based stain. The last time I used this was about 15 years ago, and it didn't go too well, but I thought certainly by now they must have perfected water-based stain, and it's better for the environment. So I followed the instructions and uh, put some stain on, let it set for 5 to 10 minutes, and then wiped it off with a cloth. Unfortunately, this is where things went downhill. Uh, the water-based stain did not work out nearly as well as uh, oil-based stain and left streaks on the case. So because a case like this is supposed to look DIY, I'm okay with it. But if this was a project that I was really concerned about and was perhaps making for somebody else, I would definitely have to go back and make the entire case from scratch because this left a lot of streaks and just didn't look the way I wanted it to look. It's okay. It'll pass. But I was really disappointed in the finish. Three coats of water-based polyurethane also wasn't the greatest. Uh, it said you didn't need to sand, but if, again, if I was to go back and do this over again, I definitely would have sanded before the last coat of polyurethane. I guess I could still do that if I wanted to. Now it's finally time to mount everything in the case. Now this can be a bit tricky because I'm using quarter inch plywood, which is really 3 sixteenths of an inch thick. And most screws will go right through that and poke out the other side. So I'm going to be mounting everything on some extra scrap pieces of wood so that the screws themselves don't actually poke through to the other side. This means gluing in strips for the keyboard and also gluing in some strips so that the motherboard can be mounted while leaving an air gap for air to flow across the back of the motherboard. It's also time to remove the electrical tape and uh, janky switch that I had been using up till this point and install a proper power receptacle and a power switch that's period appropriate. Now I have to do something about the video signal. So the video signal uh, comes out here and I had this little pigtail connected to an RCA jack so that I could plug this via an RCA cable into the monitor. Well, now that the board is shifted 90 degrees, um, unless I want to snake this out, I guess, underneath, which I could do. I guess I could do that like that and snake it out. That's one way. But instead, what I want to do is I want to run a cable from here. I'll redo this connector and run a cable from here all the way to the back. And I've drilled a hole in the back for an RCA jack. Um, However, I don't just want to use bare wire like this anymore because I'm going to be passing by the transformer wires and I'm going to be passing close to the mains input. So there's a lot of oscillation and noise and things like that going on here that I want to avoid. So uh, I need to make a new cable. That being said, I went down to the local thrift store and I found a couple of cables. This one's just for me to because I... Anytime I see a splitter like this, I pick one up uh, for 69 cents. Um, anyway, I wanted to show the difference between these two cables. This is the one that I'm going to reuse for this connector. And the reason why, as you can tell, it's a lot thicker. And uh, it's actually for a subwoofer connection. Okay, this is acoustic research. Anyway, this is the cable that I'm going to cut and make a new connection. And the reason why is this should be shielded. It's very thick, and I think it's shielded. And so uh, I have a better chance of passing this shielded cable underneath these uh, uh, power cables, because there's really no other way to do it. I can either go around this way, right past the mains, or I can go underneath this way, 
But in either way, I'm going to have to go buy some power connections. So I'm going to use this shielded cable as opposed to a cable like this, which is most likely unshielded. It certainly seems thin enough. This probably just has a, a plastic uh, jacket for the cord over a couple of wires. And uh, so anyway, to avoid picking up any extra interference, I'm going to try using this thick um, cable and see how that goes. One last thing to do was to put some rubber feet on the bottom so that uh, the case didn't scratch up the surface of a table or something. I'm using these little rubber feet and putting them on the part that goes uh, kind of inside. It's really the bottom panel of the case. And that is because it is the most heavy part now that the transformers are mounted to it. So if I had put these on the outside, then there would be a lot of weight bearing down on those four screws that are holding the bottom to the sides and that could eventually pull out because those transformers are heavy okay so here's the final product apple one case finish there's some glare here but uh, you'll have to excuse that and a period monitor which sits on top really nice and the case itself the top of the case holds the monitor even though it's pretty heavy it doesn't bow or anything so that's really good so the only thing left to do is Turn it on, let's make sure it's working. And there we go, that's what it looks like. Nice warm glow of the power light, flush with the top of the case here, which is really nice. Still a few little um, places of tear out there that I need to clean up. But otherwise, yeah, it looks really, really good. So there it is. Let's make sure the keyboard's working. Reset. Yep, everything's working great. All right, well, I've had a second to catch my breath and the Apple One case actually came out pretty good. I was a little disappointed with the finish, but actually when you look at it and compare it to the, um, the actual cases that were around with the authentic units, uh, you'll find that the case is actually pretty darn close, I think. I would love to get a close-up look at some of the cases that are in museums or in personal collections so that I can actually compare this case with one side by side. It would be pretty interesting. The other thing that I want to do is build a new case for the Apple One. Probably won't do a video on it, but I want to build a plexiglass case that looks very similar to this and that I can uh, bring to conventions or shows and let people actually see what's inside. Because while this looks authentic, it's kind of hiding all of the goodness that was built into that Apple One. And I want to be able to show that off from time to time as well. So that's going to do it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. There's one more in this series, and that is connecting a cassette and getting programs to load. I know a couple of you in the comments have said, when are we going to see a program running on this thing instead of the blinking at signs? Well, that's coming up on the next one. When I get the cassette player up and running and able to load programs, we'll definitely take a look at what's out there. There's not a lot, but we'll check it out, see what there is, see if we can get anything to load. Please be sure to subscribe to the channel. So many of you have already. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it does mean a lot and it helps grow the channel because YouTube picks up on that and shows more people my content so that they can discover it too. Also, stick around after this video if you're a patron where I'll do a little bit of commentary on some of the challenges I had with building this thing. Uh, if you'd like to become a patron, be sure to sign up at patreon.com slash retrohackshack. That's all for now, guys. We'll see you next time. If you want to support me on Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash retrohackshack and sign up. End of line.